It seemed only a short time before Stanchion stood and raised a questioning eyebrow at me. I nodded and picked up my loot case. It suddenly looked terribly shabby to me. Together we walked up the stairs. As soon as my foot touched the stage, the room hushed to a murmur. At the same time, my nervousness left me, burned away by the attention of the crowd. It has always been that way with me. Off stage, I worry and sweat. On stage, I am calm as a windless winter night. Stanchion bade everyone consider me as a candidate for my talent. His words had a soothing, ritual feel. When he gestured to me, there was no familiar applause, only an expectant silence. In a flash, I saw myself as the audience must see me. Not finely dressed as the others had been, in fact, only one step from being ragged. Young, almost a child, I could feel their curiosity drawing them closer to me. I let it build, taking my time as I unclasped my battered second-hand loot case and removed my battered second-hand loot. I felt their attention sharpen at the homely sight of it. I struck a few quiet chords, then touched the pegs, tuning it ever so slightly. I fingered a few more light chords, testing, listened, and nodded to myself. The lights shining onto the stage made the rest of the room dim from where I sat. Looking out, I saw what seemed to be a thousand eyes. Simon and Willem, Stanchion by the bar, Diorc by the door. I felt a vague flutter in my stomach as I saw Ambrose watching me with all the menace of a smoldering coal. I looked away from him to see a bearded man in red, Count Threep, an old couple holding hands, a lovely dark-eyed girl. My audience. I smiled at them. A smile drew them closer still, and I sang. Still, sit, although you listen long, long would you wait, without the hope of song so sweet as this. Azillion himself said down an age ago, masterwork of a master's life of Savian and Halloween, the woman he would take to wife. I let the wave of whisper pass through the crowd. Those who knew the song made soft exclamation to themselves, while those who didn't asked their neighbors what the stir was about. I raised my hands to the strings and drew their attention back to me. The room stilled, and I began to play. The music came easily out of me, my lute like a second voice. I flicked my fingers, and the lute made a third voice as well. I sang in the proud, powerful tones of Savian Traliard, greatest of the Amir. The audience moved under the music like grass against the wind. I sang as Sir Savian, and I felt the audience begin to love and fear me. I was so used to practicing the song alone that I almost forgot to double the third refrain, but I remembered at the last moment in a flash of cold sweat. This time as I sang it, I looked out into the audience, hoping at the end I would hear a voice answering my own. I reached the end of the refrain before Halloween's first stanza. I struck the first chord hard and waited as the sound of it began to fade without drawing a voice from the audience. I looked calmly out to them, waiting. Every second a greater relief vied with a greater disappointment inside me. Then a voice drifted onto stage, gentle as a brushing feather, singing. Savian, how could you know? It was the time for you to come to me. Savian, do you remember the days we squandered pleasantly? How well, then, have you carried what have tarried in my heart and memory? She sang as Halloween, I as Savian. On the refrains her voice spun, twinning and mixing with my own. Part of me wanted to search the audience for her, 
to find the face of the woman I was singing with. I tried once, but my fingers faltered as I searched for the face that could fit with the cool moonlight voice that answered mine. Distracted, I touched a wrong note, and there was a burr in the music. A small mistake. I set my teeth and concentrated on my playing. I pushed my curiosity aside and bowed my head to watch my fingers, careful to keep them from slipping on the strings. And we sang. A voice like burning silver, my voice an echoing answer. Savian sang solid, powerful lines like branches of a rock-old oak. All the while, Halloween was like a nightingale, moving in darting circles around the proud limbs of it. I was only dimly aware of the audience now, dimly aware of the sweat on my body. I was so deeply in the music that I couldn't have told you where it stopped and my blood began. But it did stop. Two verses from the end of the song. The end came. I struck the beginning chord of Savian's verse and I heard a piercing sound that pulled me out of the music like a fish dragged from deep water. A string broke. High on the neck of the lute it snapped and the tension lashed it across the back of my hand, drawing a thin bright line of blood. I stared at it numbly. It should not have broken. None of my strings were worn badly enough to break, but it had. And as the last notes of the music faded into silence, I felt the audience begin to stir. They began to rouse themselves from the waking dream that I had woven for them out of strands of song. In the silence, I felt it all unraveling, the audience waking with the dream unfinished, all my work ruined, wasted. And all the while burning inside me was the song, the song, the song. Without knowing what I did, I set my fingers back to the string and fell deep into myself. Into years before, when my hands had calluses like stones and my music had come as easy as breathing. Back to the time I had played to make the sound of wind turning a leaf on a lute with six strings. And I began to play. Slowly. Then with greater speed as my hands remembered. I gathered the fraying strands of song and wove them carefully back to what they had been a moment earlier. It was not perfect. No song as complex as Sasavian can be played perfectly on six strings instead of seven, but it was whole. And as I played, the audience sighed, stirred, and slowly fell back under the spell that I had made for them. I hardly knew they were there, and after a minute I forgot them entirely. My hands danced, then ran, then blurred across the strings as I fought to keep the lute's two voices singing with my own. Then, even as I watched them, I forgot them. I forgot everything except finishing the song. The refrain came, and Halloween sang again. To me, she was not a person or even a voice. She was just a part of the song that was burning out of me. And then it was done. Raising my head to look at the room was like breaking the surface of the water for air. I came back into myself, found my hand bleeding and my body covered in sweat. Then the ending of the song struck me like a fist in my chest, as it always does, no matter where or when I listen to it. I buried my face in my hands and wept. Not for a broken lute string and the chance of failure, not for blood shed and a wounded hand. I did not even cry for the boy who had learned to play a lute with six strings in the forest years ago. I cried for Sir Savian and Halloween, for love lost and found and lost again, at cruel fate and man's folly. And so for a while, I was lost in grief and knew nothing. I held all of my mourning for Savian and Halloween to a few moments. Knowing I was still on display, I gathered myself and straightened in my chair to look out at my audience. My silent audience. Music sounds different to the one who plays it. It is the musician's curse. 
Even as I sat, the ending I had improvised was fading from my memory. Then came doubt. What if it hadn't been as whole as it had seemed? What if my ending hadn't carried the terrible tragedy of the song to anyone but myself? What if my tears seemed to be nothing more than a child's embarrassing reaction to his own failure? Then, waiting, I heard the silence pouring from them. The audience held themselves quiet, tense, and tight, as if the song had burned them worse than flame. Each person held their wounded selves closely, clutching their pain as if it were a precious thing. Then there was a murmur of sobs released and sobs escaping, a sigh of tears, a whisper of bodies slowly becoming no longer still. Then the applause. A roar like leaping flame, like thunder after lightning.